Hello, everyone. I'm Amanda Paris. What gets me up in the morning is the hunger and desire to tell and share stories. In high school, I read the slave narrative of Harriet Jacobs, and I was inspired. Her story was incredible, and I decided because, I don't know, I had this sort of mindset that I wanted to write a theatrical adaptation to this slave narrative. I don't even think I really knew what an adaptation was, and I'd never written a play in my life, but I was going to do it. I was going to do it, and I was going to star in it and direct it and present it at my school's first ever Black History Month assembly. Ambitious, I know. Maybe foolhardly as well, too. But after months of agonizing over the script, weeks of rehearsals, and countless sleepless nights, the day finally arrived. And I will not lie to you, it was a terrible production. I definitely did not do Harriet Jacobs' story justice. The dialogue was campy, if I'm being generous. The direction was confused. Due to some casting issues, the slave master was actually played by a black woman, which made it seem like something out of the Twilight Zone. <laughs> but in the midst of all of the mess, something in there felt like magic to hear words that I wrote performed on stage, to see an audience going on a journey that I helped to craft, it, it was a life-altering experience. Unfortunately, you'll have to take my word that any of this all happened because to this day, there is no evidence of its occurrence <laughs> other than a script that I will never show to the public. As a novice first-time event producer, I had assumed that my high school newspaper would come to the first ever Black History Month assembly and write about it. I was certain that my play would be covered by the yearbook committee. I was sure that the administration would invite the trustee and the superintendent who came to all the other big events of the school year. I was sadly mistaken. At the end of the semester, I scoured through the yearbook, passing pages on the talent show and the spring dance and all the Halloween costumes, looking for an article, a photograph, a sentence even, acknowledging that my play or that this Black History Month assembly had ever happened. That day, I realized for the first, but definitely not the last time, that because it wasn't documented, because there was no evidence, my play, my work, that assembly, would be forgotten forever. What gets me up in the morning is the hunger and desire to tell and share stories. What keeps me up at night is the fear of being forgotten. I fear that I will do all of this work, I will write these scripts, I will write these stories, and then it, the work, and me will never be remembered. I was reminded by a colleague that the fear of being forgotten is kind of this universal existential crisis. It's part of why we give our children our last names and why we write memoirs. It's why in the island of Grenada, where my mom is from, people huddle around the TV watching something called the death news, where every evening people are named who have died in the island that day, and people exchange stories about all those who've passed. It's kind of morbid, but it's also a way of honoring lives that have gone. The idea of our lives being inconsequential, reduced to less than a footnote in this great text of life, it can be a bit of a blow to the ego. But beyond the universality of this fear of being forgotten is something that I want us to recognize in this country, in Canada. We have a problem when it comes to remembering, particularly when it comes to the lives and legacies of racialized and indigenous people. We don't like to remember the hard stuff. And a lot of the hard stuff in this country's history has the lives and experiences of indigenous and racialized people at its center. So Canada has decided to make a practice of forgetting and in doing so has allowed and encouraged entire institutions and a national culture to function and flourish in a collective state of amnesia that filtered all the way down to my high school. Canada's denial, I want to emphasize, goes well beyond the surface level narrative of diversity, inclusion, and tokenism. Cultural invisibility on this level should be seen as an act of violence. In Yasmin Jawani's 2006 book, Discourses of Denial, Mediations of Race, Gender, and Violence, she argues that Canada has created several versions of what can be called the ideal citizen, and our stories circle around this ideal citizen. The first is what she dubs the reasonable person. So let's call our reasonable person Joe. Joe is your all-Canadian, law-abiding, plaid-wearing, white, middle-class person. He's an easygoing guy, doesn't like to kick up a fuss, and Joe always, always pays his taxes on time. 
Joe comes from humble beginnings, but he's worked hard and pulled himself up by the bootstraps. Joe always recycles and always makes sure to vote. He's not a fan of those who are always hammering on about injustice. Joe believes that everyone is equal. It's up to the individual to determine what they will and will not do with their lives. Dr. Jawani argues that there is also an immigrant version of this ideal citizen. She calls them the preferred immigrant, AKA the conditional Canadian. Let's call this person Rita. Rita never talks about the trauma and baggage she carries from the journey she took to get here. She takes her family to watch fireworks on Canada Day. She knows all the words to the anthem and she studied hard for her citizenship test. She is eternally grateful for all the opportunities Canada has bestowed on her and her children. Rita believes in the systems that define this country, the education system, the justice system, the electoral system, and she knows that success can be hers too as long as she works hard enough. I'm not Rita, and clearly I can never be Joe. I don't like plaid. I'm frequently late paying my taxes. Oh, not frequently, sometimes. No, no one from CRA is here, hopefully. I spent 10 years building curriculum because I deeply believe the education system in this country is dangerously flawed. My upcoming play is centered on the injustices many have experienced while navigating the justice system. I kick up many fusses. I've attended numerous protests and will continue to. And I know that hard work in a society built on inequity does not automatically yield success. Does that mean, because I dive deeply into the hard stories that Canada prefers to forget, that me and my work will get forgotten? It's a very strange place to be as a content creator. Last fall, a CBC Angus Reid poll revealed that 68% of Canadians believe that minorities should do more to fit into mainstream Canadian society. 68%. When asked the same question, only 53% of Americans believe that immigrants need to do more. We, the Canadian mosaic, beat the American melting pot. This poll to told me that 68% of Canadians probably won't appreciate my work and my stories. And maybe that poll is right. In February, I wrote an article entitled Seven African Canadian Female Filmmakers Whose Names You Should Know. This list included people such as Jennifer Hodge De Silva, Claire Preto, and Sylvia Hamilton, pioneers who in my book should be household names. But most of Canada has never seen their films and has never heard of them. Most of Canada has also never heard of the black arts movement in Canada or of the pioneering work of radio DJ Ron Nelson or of the queer and trans writing group A's for Orange or the time a generation of young people tried to stop gun violence in Toronto through art. These people have done work, tons of work, but because they delve deeply into the hard stuff, the stuff Canada so often wants to forget, the stuff that doesn't fit the ideal citizen, they are frequently forgotten. The Canada that I want to see is the one that stops patting itself on the back for its progressiveness and starts being real about its prejudice. Maybe then it will be ready to remember my, our stories. Thank you.